kids are doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the watch, <laughs> counting down the times, you know. Hello and welcome to Inside Property and Finance Podcast, where we talk all things finance as well as money. How can we fund and finance our deals? And topic of this podcast is going to be all about equity release, because I'm going to talk about the mindset approach, because what we taught from a young age is that idea of buying a home and over time continually to pay it down until we're mortgage free. So I want to have a conversation, chat around that, give a different perspective to it, and just to help you understand the concept of equity release and why you should utilize it in order to build some serious wealth. So of course, I'm here with both Steve and Paul, my business partners at Express Mortgages. If you're looking to get a mortgage, whether it's your residential, buy to lets bridge and development finance, all things finance, head over to expressmortgages.co.uk so we can help you out. So let's get into this whole conversation of equity release. So let's talk about what it is, how we can access it, what's the type of rates and why someone may want to consider it. So we'll just start with what it's not, I think. Yeah. Okay. So equity release for a lot of people is the type of mortgage you get when you're older, you need a bit of money to help, well, maybe to pay off a, the remainder of an, an older mortgage or some money to help you get through your, with extra pension and stuff like that. That's an equity release mortgage. Equity release in general terms is borrowing against your house to then use that money to go and do something. And that could be buy a car, it could be go on holiday, it could be convert the loft, it could be all sorts of things. But many people that we've dealt with over the last 20 odd years have borrowed against the main residence and use that money to then start buying, buy to lets or, or doing investments. Um, what we have to stress, because the FCA won't like it if we don't, we have to stress is that borrowing is regulated and it, that part of your borrowing in your property journey needs to be affordable. If it's not affordable, you won't get the money in the first place, but it does have to be affordable. But it is a, it is a way that many people have got the initial lump of money to get going in property, whether it be the, a further advance with the lender that they're with, completely separate lender where they take their existing mortgage move it somewhere else and get a bigger mortgage or even a second charge. So that's a, or a second mortgage, one that sits on top of the one that you've already got. And there's reasons why that can be the best way to go about it, but it can also be a bit of a problem solver that one. But in general, it's borrowing against the equity in your house to create a cash fund. Yeah. So let's talk about equity again, and I'm going to throw in some questions that I commonly get and it'd be good to get a broker's take on <laughs> um, your viewpoint and, and how to answer that. So of course, in simple terms, your house, someone goes and buys it, you know, you buy your house, let's just make it simple numbers. You buy it for a hundred grand, right? And you're gonna go and get a residential mortgage. Maybe you get that at a 90% loan to value. So you get a mortgage for 90,000. So you have 10% in there, which would have been your deposit, but that is equity. Now, let's say five years go by and that property goes up in value and it's now worth 120000 Now your equity from the mortgage, maybe you have been paying towards that mortgage because you're in a capital repayment, so you're paying the mortgage down. It's went from 90 and it's down to 70 and now it's worth 120 So now you've got £50,000 equity there, the difference between the outstanding mortgage and what the property is now worth. So an exercise that I always recommend people do is look at your own home. First and foremost, go and check and see what's outstanding on your mortgage. There's the first number. How much do you think your property is worth? Can you look at some comparables around? Have you had a valuation port recently? Not that I recommend you go and do that, but looking at comparables and understanding how much is your, your house worth? And there's the difference. So some people ask me all the time is, well, how much of that equity can I get? So maybe that's the first question to start because... You mentioned about affordability, which we'll, we'll discuss there. So how much more of that equity can they take all out? Is it some of it? You know, should they be doing that? Maybe let's have a conversation around that. Yeah, great question. And also, Paul, it just shows to people that you can go from 90%, because I think they're quite realistic figures that you just said there, 90% to, what, just under 60% in five years' time. So suddenly you've got 40 or so equity percent equity in your is property. Is that because that they're paying down the mortgage, <clears throat> then their loan to value is shrinking down, is shrinking. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's it. On a capital repayment, of course, you're reducing that debt and the value is increasing. So um, you can get up to, with a further advance, so let's say you're with Royal Bank of Scotland, 
for, forgive me, Steve, because again, and this might be more so for me, but explain like a further advance. When we're using some of these mortgage jargon things, I'm talking to the younger Paul here that needed to even understand and know what a further advance was. <laughs> right. If we just kind of explain some of the simple jargon Sure, terms. sure. So yeah, let's say we're with Royal Bank of Scotland, our £90,000 mortgages now, £70,000. We're staying with Royal Bank of Scotland, and that might be for a number of reasons, but let's imagine we're tied into a fixed rate and there's penalties if we change lenders. So what we could do is take extra borrowing or as you say, release equity from um, the property. So th that's just known in, in the industry as a further advance. So you might go from 70,000, you wanna take out, let's say 20 grand, bring it back to 90, lift that mortgage up to 90,000. So in effect, you've got two pots of mortgage, but with the same lender. So that's, that's generally what that means. Um, now you might change, uh, decide, sorry, to change lender because you've come to the end of the penalty period and it makes sense to shop around the market or get a broker too like us and uh, get your interest rate lower. So um, then you can move from RBS to say Santander or Halifax or whoever. And uh, that £70,000 mortgage can change to another provider, but at the same time you increase that debt to the 90,000 to take your 20,000 out. Yeah, so there's a couple of different mm. ways of getting that equity, staying with mm. the same lender yeah. or moving all together. Another way might be the second charge that Paul mentions, whereby, um, you again, you could be tied into the lender that you're with. You've still got penalties if you move. But let's say you had a, a challenge a couple of years ago or a year ago, and you've got a county court judgment against you. Your credit file is not perfect. And um, a high street lender, it's just going to be problematic changing that mortgage. That's fine. You can stay with the RBS mortgage. And then we could um, have a second charge to sit on top, which is just like another um, another lender to give you that £20,000. Might be a little bit more in the interest rate, but at least you're not letting go of the bulk of that mortgage with RBS and go into a more of a subprime lender. Yeah. So that's just one reason why you might take a, a second charge out but then you still get to release the uh, the equity. Now with second charges, you can go up to um, a higher percentage of the property's value. So with that further advance, the first example typically is about 90%. You might get 85 with some lenders, 90 with others. With a remortgage, it might be 90%, possibly 95. With a second charge, you can go to 100 with some lenders. You can even go to 140% at the value of your home, I think with one lender. So you can pull out more equity. It's got to be affordable, that's the thing. And uh, you will pay more in the rate for that kind of loan to value, but it's possible if there's a good enough reason for doing it. So let's run through a scenario there and keep numbers simple. So if we go along with the the same concept that I've, I mentioned there, I've bought a property it's for £100,000, had to put a 10% deposit down, so I've got £90,000 mortgage, and I want to borrow some equity but my existing lender is, they're like, nope, we can't give you any more because you only have 10% equity there. Our criteria is we won't give you a fuller advance. Speak to a broker and the broker looks at it, go, yeah, we're not able to refinance you over to another lender because, you know, it's not worth doing. So again, a broker is going to present those options. But a good broker, a bit like us at Express there, may say, hey, look, look at this second charge lending. So in theory, and of course, affordability is incredibly important and we can talk about why you might want to consider doing this. In theory, if it goes up to 140% of the value of the property, in theory, I've got access to 45,000. Oh, sorry, 50,000, the 10,000 between the 90 and 100 mm -hmm. and the extra over and above. And you might be thinking, well, is that a good idea? Because it's technically going to be a charge against your property, putting you into negative equity. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a cost against that. And whatever that cost is, what we need to be mindful of, assuming that this is an investor that's going to do this, because this is what frightens me, what you're using that money for, right? If that money is for you to go on a holiday and for you to go and, you know, um, splash the cash on depreciating things, then, of course, that's a big no-no. But an assumption if you're going to take that money potentially to go into a buy to flip deal, mm. right? And that there is allowing you to then invest in a property and allowing you to make profits to then be able to repay that back. And whether you get that much or not, it'll be down to the lender's discretion, mainly around your affordability, because you're going to be increasing your borrowings. And the last question is what it's getting used for as well, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, 
I, I think it'd be good just now because we'll go into a bit more about equity because again, it's common questions that I get, which I think would be good to get your take on it. But the mindset around equity release because it's so drilled into us. And when I do my jumpstart events, and uh, you know, we've got we've got people that are in their thirties and their forties and they're interested in property, and their thought process. This is anyone really, but it tends to be that group. Their thought process is, yeah, let's pay them a mortgage. I want to be mortgage free. Interest only mortgages? No, capital. I want. I want to pay it down. And when I probe to ask questions as to why, it's one of those ones where it goes back to, well, it's kind of what I've always known, what I was taught and what I believe that I should be doing. And, you know, debt is bad and I don't want to borrow lots of money. And, you know, and, and then this is an analogy that I give. And I just get your viewpoint as well, because I guess everyone's different. But, and I use this and try and make it a little bit graphic, but put a bit of entertainment in it as well. And I always make the joke of, if you've got a mortgage and you're paying it down, and let's say that, you're getting on a little bit and you're almost debt free or you've paid off your mortgage. Here's what your kids are doing. Your kids are doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the watch, tick counting tock, down the times, tock, you know. Tick tick so tick they're tick like, tick okay, you okay there, dad? You know, you, you feeling all right? And I make joke with <laughs> why, it. Why do you start smoking, dad? <laughs> <laughs> I make joke with it, but God forbid the day is going to come and let's say that you, you know, that you, you pass and you've left a half a million pound home, debt free, mortgage free, and it's mortgage free, and you've got a couple of kids. So two things has happened. One, you're gonna give your kids a debt free property, half a million pound home, and you've not gave them an education and money. And what I mean by that is, is what are they gonna do? They're gonna split it between them. So of course there's inheritance tax and other things as well, but whatever they've got likelihood is, they'll take a large portion of that to pay down their mortgage mm -hmm. or put to another home and they'll take some money to, spend it and maybe keep some or what but I'll tell you what they're probably most likely not going to go and do because of you know learning from their parents and just what happens they're likely not going to go and invest they're likely to do the same thing because they believe themselves to because that's what mum and dad did is to pay down their mortgage and that cycle will just keep on continuing until someone breaks it and what I mean by that imagine imagine you took out £50,000 equity right or whatever you could take out it's going to be cost of borrowings there. But again, you take that and you go and put it into a simple buy to let. You don't even need to buy a, a great discount or add much value. Like a, just a traditional buy to let. Of course, what we teach and we educate is you want to buy a discount, you want to add value, you want to refinance, pull your money out and go again. But if you do that, the income that's going to be generated from that buy to let property will service the borrowing on the equity that you've borrowed to and an extra income. And if you look at that over a 10 year period, how much is that property going to be worth, that buy to let? Likely double, or at least moving towards that direction. And how much is the rent going to be 10 years from now? Likely double as well. So from that point of view, if you take it one step further and use that money to buy a property, add value, refinance, pull the money out, go again, that one pot of cash that you took of equity out your own home could build a multi-million pound property portfolio. And then when you decide to stop, you take it and put it back into your mortgage again. You pay off the equity. Mm -hmm. And the reality is when you look at that scenario, and God forbid the day comes, which it will, now you're passing on to your kids not only the home, but a bunch of buy-to-let properties as well that have all gone up in value, producing an income and passing on an education for the kids as well. So hopefully they then go and do the same thing. So I guess it's just changing the thought process because on your assets and liabilities, your equity is part of your assets, part of your net worth. And lenders know that. And that's why they're okay with you leveraging against it. And as soon as you start becoming a bit more open and aware to that, that's how wealthy people make money. They leverage that equity. And by leveraging that, they keep on building wealth. And that's why I recommend, when I say recommend, I will suggest get an interest only mortgage on buy to lets. That's kind of what professionals do anyway in the game, but some people still want capital repayment because you want cash flow at the beginning. Plus, you're likely going to refinance against that property as value goes up to give you more equity that the tenant's paying to go and buy more property. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those ways of seriously building wealth. So going back to the equity there, and of course we spoke about, about the mindset there. You touched on it as well, Steve. A lot of people will say to me, oh, but I've got penalties and if I, if, I, if I leave or if I do this here and, and they think that 
I think they miss the point of a further advance with the same lender mm. because you're not, in effect, um, breaking out of that mortgage. You're just adding another mortgage to it. Mm. Yeah. You know, so so that could be. But what does that mean with the penalties? And what does that normally mean in terms of terms? Because I think some people get caught up with that. Uh, yeah, so penalties. Let's say the mortgage is 90000 uh, A typical penalty might be for just the period that it's fixed. So if you're on a fixed rate for two years or five years or whatever, normally for that, that uh, period of time, they might charge you 2% of the balance or 5% of the balance. Let's say it's 5% because that tends to be at the higher end and it's 90000 Nine fives. Oh, I'm not going to do my maths. You know how the last time I did that. Yeah, 40, uh, 45, nine fives, 45, yes. £4,500 could be the penalty. Now, that's a fairly chunky sum, especially of a 90 grand mortgage. So you don't have to pay that um, unless you really have to or you've got a deal that's really worth it. So that's why you would still keep the mortgage with the RBS in that example, not pay a penalty and just get an extra borrowing with them uh, because that will then just carry maybe an arrangement fee, maybe not depending on the rate, and they'll give you like another two year fixed or whatever it may be for that pot. It's not only that. Imagine if someone took that mortgage, the original mortgage out two or three years ago and they're paying 1% or less because that's what oh, people were yeah, getting. Actually, yeah. You wouldn't want to give, not only do you not want to pay the penalty, you don't want to give up paying 1 or 2% on that chunk that you've already got. You want to keep that because yeah. it's so cheap. Obviously, bearing in mind that it will be more expensive in the future and we've got to keep an eye on affordability, okay? But then, yeah, you, you're not paying the penalty, you're not giving up that rate, it's just the extra bit that's on today's rates. But similarly, let, let's fast forward four or five years and someone's um, got a mortgage today at five and a half, six percent 6%. We, I'm saying paying that penalty should not necessarily be the bad thing to do because if their mortgages, when they want to get money out, have dropped a lot in cost, it might make more sense to pay the penalty to get a cheaper rate yeah. across. So people shouldn't take it as written that further advance is always the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. It probably is at the minute if that gets them enough money to get going in property. But, you know, you, you always need to speak with a broker who can look at the maths, analyse it. Should I move? Should I get a further advance? Should I get a, a second charge? What is mathematically the best thing for, for me to do? And similarly, sometimes, even though second charges are more expensive, um, if people have got maybe an issue or they want a bit more than what the current lender is willing to give them, again, that, that can be better than giving up a very cheap rate on, on the borrowing. So our teams at work will, will present often the two scenarios. You, or even three, further advance, completely separate lender, second charge, which one gives you the best result for what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah. and it's worth noting actually with the second charge because they are higher interest rates. You're not on them forever, are you? It no. might be that you've only got a year or two left on your fixed rate. And let's say you wanted to do a wraparound extension on your home, which could be a very good reason to increase the debt more than its current value. But then when you've done your extension, that value should be more than what the debt is. You can then refinance the whole lot to either with the same lender or a different lender once that the bulk of that mortgage comes up for renewal when it comes out of this penalty period. Yeah, it goes back to having a conversation with your broker, isn't it? Definitely. Like it's crazy how many people think that they don't have access to much funds or they mm. feel limited. But a simple conversation with a great broker, of course, who can look at the person's circumstances, situation, look at the equity in their own home and, and any other assets and explore these options and have conversations. The first thing I always say to anyone who comes through our program, the first thing you should be doing on Monday morning after this program is get in touch with Express and share with them your personal circumstances. Let them know what they need to know because th that will be relevant to um, going to different lenders. And then mention a little bit more about your proposed plan going forward. So, 100%, they've, so they've got the whole 100%, picture. Because, mm. you know, we, we sit here as birds of a feather, yeah. Our attitude is leverage, 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 let like build, build, build. And, you know, we've all been in property to fairly decent levels. Um, it's not for everyone, though. Some people want to get into property, but they do want to stop after one, maybe two properties because it's, it's more of a retirement supplement rather than a career change. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we understand if that's their ambition, there's nothing wrong with that. Some people don't want to get in property full oh, stop. Oh, yeah, there's no judgment whatsoever. Yeah, no judgment. You know, one or two is fine. You know, we're talking about equity out of your home. We understand it's a very personal thing. 
you know, there's very much strong rules and regulations over the affordability and that. But once we got over that, it's what is it that you want to achieve here? And if it's just like take 50,000 out and get a couple of buy to lets, then that gives us one scenario. If someone says, right, oh, and I want to pay down the debts on the buy to let over a period of time and just end up with two properties rented out unencumbered, and, and yeah, repayment's right for that person across all three of those properties in that example. If they're a bit more like us idiots, <laughs> in the loosest sense of the word, it's like, I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you now, right, I have never paid a pound off a mortgage, ever, unless I've sold the property. That's different, yeah? I have never paid a pound off a mortgage. I've had everything on interest only, including my, my main residence. I've got to be careful, haven't I, because it's not for everyone, but... Yeah, I guess that's the key, it, isn't it? Yeah, Who's it for? Um, yeah. You know, I've, I've got... I hope I'm kind of sophisticated enough financially to understand the risks and what I need to do and how it all works. And, you know, I've got my FPCs, I've got my CE maps, I've got a degree in accountancy. I've, I hope I'm there, yeah. I'm not so bad at maths either. Um, <laughs> but, um, I, again, I, I look at the people that we deal with and the ones that end up the millionaires, property, I mean, real property millionaires, yeah. Not the ones who think all oh, the portfolios with this and that. <laughs> it's that real serious property millionaires. They do exactly the same. They leverage as much as they can in the cheapest form possible, and they, they don't pay a penny, a, a penny off. They just keep going and going and going. And people think, hold on a minute, where does that end up? What about when you're oh my 70? God, he's in millions 70, of debt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I remember telling my mum when I first got over the million pound of borrowing mark, and she, she, I think she nearly took to her bed as she says, oh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> Say, but the properties were for X amount more, Mum. I've, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got equity and the rents are more, they're up here and the mortgages are down, et cetera, and all that. But the, the problem used to be, and, and this is where, again, people, I think, are, are, are behind the times with how property investment works. It used to be you get to 70, 75, and the lenders want the money back. No longer the case. Some will give you it to 80, 85, 90. 100, 110 years of age. Because what they understand is, as long as the property's there with rent coming in, what's it matter how old that person is? And, and you know, and clearly there's personal ambition there. The people really want to be landlords when they're at the 90. Well, I'm sure they'll sort that out when they get there. But when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, that's a long, long way away. But not something that people should fear like they, they used to. You know, I'm going to have this doomsday event when the lenders all go, give me back your dough. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, I've got to evict, evict all my tenants and that. That just isn't the case anymore. Yeah. And this is why, for me, when you really start to understand leverage and the equity, and it's not for everyone, as we're saying here, but for, for most it is, if you want to build wealth, as we've been saying here, but if you take equity from one home, your main home normally, and you put it into another property to buy, as time goes on, and if you look at it as the last 250 years show, property prices double every, what, 12 to 15 years, there or thereabouts. So it's not just one property, it's increasing in equity over the long term. It's that property and the other one that you've purchased as well. And if you are getting good at property investment where you're recycling that money, buying, adding value, refinancing, putting it into another property, think about that portfolio. It's almost like... At the beginning, it feels like hard work building a property portfolio, sourcing a deal, getting it going. But time then comes into your favour. 10 years from now, 15 years from now, you're like, shit, I just keep them getting more and more money because those properties double in value, keeps on going. But it's not just one property, it's multiples of properties. And that's where things really start to catapult. And then you're like, oh, I've got, oh, I've got millions of equity that you can take more and then go even quicker as well. And this is how it becomes a tipping point at some point where you've got access to way more funds and get involved in a lot more projects. I mean, of course, some people just want to have a handful of properties, yeah. you know, and that might be to the extent that they do. But if you really start to look at this game and you have a bit of a longer term viewpoint in this, it is frightening how wealthy you can become by just getting started and leveraging a thing that most people are so motivated just to pay off the debt. Well, this is where I think it, to, to people getting into property, you can't stress it enough. Get you know, Have a decent mortgage broker, of course, but you need to talk to brokers who are 
experience in buy to let and property property investment as a whole anyway, because there's a whole heap of other things that you need to talk about. So if you're going to keep tapping the equity of properties, it goes up. What happens come the day where maybe you want to sell one and you've got a capital gains tax bill and you've leveraged it to the eyeballs? Yeah. Things like, and that's not something to be scared of. That's just something to plan for. So as you teach, you know, have a great power team around you. So that, so that might be a mortgage broker and an accountant, say. But, you know, people who can look at it and go, if if you borrow that money, this is the scenario that you that you're left in. Yeah, and similarly, you know, as, as we'll say to first-time buyers, residential borrowers, buy-to-let borrowers, you've got to look down the line. So if you're taking a rate fixed at, you know, we've all agreed they, they were too low for too long. You took a five-year rate at 1%, and then you went and bought three cars, went on two holidays, and <laughs> you've got to appreciate that that's going to cost something down the line. So it's it's a it's the holistic view. Um, but some, just to try and move this on to just another idea here, because we see this a lot, and this is how I got moving in properties. Instead of moving into buy to let, it's starting with let to buy. And it's a different, it, it, it's a posh way of saying, I'm going to rent out my my current property. And this is what I did. I, I, I took the mortgage on it and I increased it to fund a deposit for the house that I moved from Liverpool to, to Wigan into. And properties went up in value and I borrowed against the one in Wigan. I actually then sold the one in Liverpool to then go and buy a lot more property. And then subsequently I've moved on again from there. And it's and it's it's that now you can still release your equity under the let to buy. You go on to your residential and, and if you if you're comfortable in moving home, because not everyone wants to move home, I get that. But I, I've always been quite easy to move for a profit. <laughs> you know, it's one thing that I didn't need a lot of convincing over. So I've got, I've acquired property, improved its value, and market value has helped us, of course. And all of a sudden, over the years, I'm talking hundreds of thousands of pounds of tax free profit because I've done let to buy. I've done buy to let as well, don't get me wrong, but the let to buy is what. Arguably, I've made more money out than anything else. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. very good. And that, that's a form of equity release, you know. Absolutely. So. And I think what would be good for maybe our next podcast or one of the future ones is we talk about the difference between, you know, getting mortgage your own personal name and in a limited company because there's more tax efficient strategies there to understand yep. and know, especially around capital gains and things too, because that's, that's the idea, isn't it? And why I think a lot of people should get educated and start to see the bigger picture because mm -hmm. what starts off with just one property, trust me, <laughs> once it starts, it's one of those ones that you get hooked and you start to see the benefits of it, especially if done right. And before you know it, you want to build that big portfolio, you're seeing the benefits of it, you want to get into property development and other strategies and everything else as well. Because, you know, there's many different ways you can build your wealth. But the solid way, the way that, you know, if you look at the Sunday Times Rich List, the top 100, 85 of them have either made their money through property or wherever they've made their money, they've then invested large sums of that into property. You know, you look at, um, you know, Peter Jones from Dragon's Den became a billionaire because he invested it into property. You know, so, um, or Lloyds, Lloyds Bank. Lloyds Bank, I'm, I'm <laughs> massive just now, yeah. aren't they? You know, it's, it's just crazy. And then you've got Lord Sugar. And Lord Sugar paid himself only a few years ago 395 million dividends from his property holdings company. And this is what I love. And and just to, to, to touch on that with two more examples, you know, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates are the biggest private landlords in the whole of America with land and commercial and residential. You know, you've even Warren Buffett talking about Berkshire Halfway starting to go into, you know, um, buying properties as well and go aggressive there. And then the one that we've all seen if we watched the movie Founder about Ray Kroc, you know, McDonald's, we're not in the burger flipping business, we're in the real estate business, yeah, yeah. you know, and they were able to leverage. McDonald's became the company they are today because at one point they realized, I can't make money on milkshakes and fucking burgers, mm -hmm. right? I, I, where's the real money here? Mm -hmm. Ah, it's owning the building, mm -hmm. right? And as soon as they started doing yeah. that, then it, it changed everything. And I think that is underpins a lot of the franchise models as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And at the other end of the spectrum, Paul, we talk about those that maybe just want one or two. You know, you, you can, um, the lady that we know, the client that we know, she had, I can't remember, it was like two or three buy-to-lets. And then this portfolio came away and she bought 49 properties in one go. 
yeah. you know, with less than a hundred grand of her own money. So that's possible because people will be thinking, yeah, but that's for the wealthy. That's for people, generational wealth and all this. No, that's just having a good team around you. You know, the portfolio was below market value, granted, but they do come around, as we know, and uh, using creative finance to acquire that and a little bit of your own money, some private investment, as we've talked about in previous podcasts, and away you go, you acquire all those properties. And if you want to deleverage a little bit, you know, lower the debt against the value, you can always, you know, renovate as you should do, sell a few off and maybe hold just 32 like she did. And before you know it, you've got 10 grand a month cash flow coming in. So not a bad income. It doesn't have to be just for buy to lets either. You know, that that's a bit more long term, isn't it? That's mm -hmm. people who are going to buy and hold and rent and profit. That nothing wrong with that. But you, you can you can take your equity out for flips and, you know, things in general. Um, and I, th I think it's underestimated the... Um, again, I won't go into too much detail on this, but people... They hate the idea of taking out a 25-year debt for property investment on the home and being lumbered with it for that long or being tied into it for five years in case they, you know, they don't they don't like property investment or it's like, well, hold on a minute, if I, if I just want to do a couple of flips in this next year or two, I want to be able to then get rid of that debt again. You know, just different people's mindset. And then you think, and people say, oh, so you know, that's not for me. Does, but then you go, well, hold on a minute. Has anyone ever taught you about an offset mortgage mm -hmm. where you can put a, a facility against your home and dip in and out of it as often as you want, penalty free? So you could actually go and raise 50,000, 100,000 and actually technically not have more debt than what you started with. And it's just available though, if that great deal comes along that you're so confident and comfortable in as maybe your first investment. Do that, go and flip it and take your money put it back in your offset, you're back to where you were. So an offset just, just like having an overdraft, isn't it? You only pay for it when you use it. Brilliant, brilliant product for, for people's circumstances. You know, and it, it, we are talking with people who tend to have a bit more equity percentage-wise than someone who's just bought the first house a couple of years ago, admittedly. Um, but also if you're making a lot of money each month from property, you, you know, you've got a tax bill to pay at the end of the year. What do I do with this money till the tax man wants it? put it in your offset, offset. you're not yeah. paying interest it's it's a great product it's, it's probably a podcast in itself in a way so yeah. you know like i said don't want to delve too deep and and uh, confuse people but you don't have to take out rigid finance that commits you to something that you just want to see how it feels and if you're comfortable with it yeah. i mean as we all know most people get very comfortable very quickly it's like what so I go to bed at night, that house is going up in value and someone's paying me a profit at the same time. I'm making money while I sleep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll take a bit of that, please. <laughs> yeah. So you, so you get addicted, don't you? That's the thing, though, isn't it? Equity release is probably, most likely, the cheapest cost of borrowing you can get. Absolutely. And when you look at, well, what is the cost of borrowing? And if you, if it's 3 4 5% more then where you put that money, is it going to give you a far greater return than that? That's as simple as it should be, Yeah, you know? I think what holds people back, and it goes back to the mindset that I spoke about, is that when most people get a mortgage, it's based on not, can I go into, it's like a bit like car finance. You don't go into a, a car garage and go, uh, oh, that's 50 grand. They ask, how much is the monthly payments? Oh, I can afford the monthly payments. Yeah. And it's a bit like that with a mortgage. It's like, oh, half a million pound home. Well, can I get a mortgage? And what's the monthly mortgage payments? Can I afford that? And I think that it's like a double-edged sword in the sense that people have a mortgage. There's equity there. And what tends to happen when people get a promotion or, you know, they go to a new job and they get paid more, their, their overheads, their expenses, their lifestyle starts to increase as well. And until there comes a certain point, which I don't know if it ever does for a lot of people, where they stop spending to allow the promotion or um, the new job, the extra money, and stop buying another car or a bigger home to have a big enough gap, to have disposable income, to have savings, to have a few thousand pounds a month to put towards property. Most people never have that. So what ends up happening is they keep on increasing their cost of living in terms of in borrowing and everything else. And All the government increases it on them. <laughs> yeah, so the inflation yeah. comes in and goes, come here. Yeah. So off the back of that, it's like people do want to make more money. I see it, but there's apprehension around the mortgage. 
and it's like, oh, affordability. And I think that they'll look at it and go, well, I've got equity. And it's just like, well, what if you took that out, did what you just suggested there, put it into a flip? That flip's going to get, I mean, one flip, if it makes you, just say it just makes you 25 grand. That's an extra 25 grand. Mm -hmm. You're not going to go and get an extra 25 grand for a, a job promotion. It's not going to happen. No. And when you start to look at that and put it into perspective, we're not talking about going out there and having to build a huge portfolio or do tons of deals. It could just be one. Yeah. Mm. You know? So I guess hopefully this gets to think a little bit more when it comes to equity in your own home and, you know, being able to leverage and use that and start to see what's possible to start really building wealth so that your kids love you more. I'm joking, right? <laughs> That's all good. Now, with that said, though, if you're looking to explore about equity release and look to see what you're able to borrow and explore maybe the second charge lending as well, then head over to expressmortgages.co.uk. Of course, we've got specialists there that can look at your circumstances, look at your situation and help you with all things lending. So again, any comments, drop them in the comments box below. We'll go in there and respond to them and make sure you're subscribed to the channel too. So all good. Catch up with you soon. Bye for now.